make ends meet. Um, if we wanted an entire family taking lessons, whether it's a little child, whether it's the, mo the mother of the child taking part in a ladies league, or whether it's a super senior, the grandfather trying to play in the evening social tennis, we wanted everybody to be able to afford it, but at the same time have quality. That was the idea behind it. Um, the last one obviously is, is the scheduling. Scheduling is very, very important because what we used to do was also send out a survey to the clients and find out from them what time is preferable to them. Because many times it's not up to what we are comfortable with, it's up to what the client is comfortable with for you to you know, run a business. So the best way to do that we found was to, to send a survey and find out what is the best day and time that they are comfortable with. That really helped uh, us a lot with the scheduling. Small, small things like scheduling a clinic after school, giving enough time, knowing the time that the, that the bell rings in school, and the time it takes for them to go home and give a snack to their kids and bring them to the tennis court. All those things we have to take in mind before we schedule an after school program. So to make sure it's, it's it's almost impossible for them not to bring their kids. That was our goal in terms of scheduling. The next, obviously, the biggest one that I'm sure you know, all of you when you're running your business, the marketing strategy. We were, um, we basically, as I told you before, our number one marketing strategy was that people that we, when we were doing a good enough job, they were talking to their friends. That was our biggest marketing till date. I mean, we have tried over the years, especially when the when the market was down. We have tried, you know, advertising in papers, you know, doing a, a giving out flyers. None of those things worked. At least for us, it didn't work. I can only say for our business. What worked was when one child plays well, and you're giving your hundred percent to that child. The parent goes and tells people that made a difference for us. That was the number one marketing thing for us. But then we had to also change with times. And that I'll talk to you a little bit more uh, as we go further. But uh, this is for us the marketing strategy was if you do a good enough job, people will talk about it. The other thing that can actually help, we haven't started doing it, was that you know to give. Um, an incentive to your you know, friends and, and family who are taking lessons from you already to give them an, an incentive that they might get a 10% break if they bring in two more students and stuff like that. So everybody is in a win-win situation with that. We haven't done that yet, but I'm hoping that will be a good idea. Um, the business continuity, that is basically once we started running all our programs simultaneously, Basically, letting our own pros know what our core values were. We were not going to let go of quality for anything. So, educating the clients and the customers as to what your core values are, that was really important. The other thing was to, not the other thing, the main thing was to assess the profit and loss. So, that was um, a couple of things as far as the tennis business is concerned is, there are not many overheads. Of course, we do have the we have to pay for the tennis courts, we have to pay for the balls, but there's not a huge paying for a tennis court is not the same as renting a stadium or renting you know office space. It's not the same. The cost is a little bit cheaper to rent a tennis court rather than rent an office space because it's not continuous. It's only during the program time that we rent. So that way, the overheads are not a whole lot. We do have the pro uh, salaries that we have to take care of. We do have to take care of the rentals of courts, the equipment of course. But apart from that, we didn't have too much overheads. So right away we found that the, uh, if, if there were less kids, we would hold back an approach. We would make sure that we were able to maintain profits most of the time. That was a, that was a huge part in us moving forward just to know that we could do this and we could maintain a profit uh, in, in all these scenarios. The third was the personnel management. 
this is again as I told you, hiring of pros was difficult. Maintaining personnel is just as difficult. And I'll tell you something, in Silicon Valley, we are at the heart of Silicon Valley. Many of my pros who have come and worked for me are now in Google, Facebook, um, all those kind of top companies. To work, come and work for a tennis academy, it's just their interim job. Nobody is looking to come and work for nearest tennis again. But, but at the same time, we were able to find some, you know, real reliable pros, especially one who's been working with us for more than six to seven years. Really classy person. So we were lucky in terms of that. But to maintain them, to make sure that their interest level, they're still motivated, is a challenge. So we need to make sure we, you know, keep motivating them. The fourth is obviously the communication. We always have to be available for them to talk to us. So even now in the US, when a client calls, I'm the one that's picking up the call. Many people, oh, you're it's Niru? So they get very surprised that I'm I'm picking up the calls myself. I want to be available for the parent to talk and of course, there are some who call at 10.30 at night, which I will try and avoid. But um, most of the times, I'm available. At the same time, we are always prompt in making sure we communicate to the parent. Whenever they send emails, it's, it's less than five, six hours that we you know, communicate back. Other thing is flexibility. There were times when many programs that we started, it didn't really take off despite how much ever we tried. There were a couple of programs in uh, uh, slightly uh, in an area called Fremont, which is a little bit further away. We tried a lot, but it didn't really work out. So then what we try to do is try to be flexible with times and try to be flexible in terms of uh, scheduling and send out a survey again to make sure that we are doing the right thing for that community. And next, the last thing in this is growing with the times. This is in connection with the marketing that, we, that I already spoke about. So when I first started this academy, we had checkbooks, we had paper forms, everything in paper format. And we are talking about Silicon Valley, where everything is computerized. So we have to make that change. Everything we have to change. Right now, a couple of years ago, we've changed everything to make sure a parent can sign up his, his daughter or his son at like 12 at night if he wants. Everything's online. The waiver form is online. Waivers are very important in the US. I don't know how important it is here, but it's very important. Then comes basically payment online. Everything is now so simple that we've gone paperless. So that's basically growing with times. It, it didn't take, it took us a little while. But now it's, it's complete and it's working very well. The other thing that, that comes with growing with times was we, are, we were having an issue when it rained. When it rained, the courts were wet. And I didn't have my computer with me to let people know that it, it is, the courts are wet and we cannot do a program we have to cancel today. Everybody was calling me. Many times they won't get through. They leave me messages. I don't have time to call them back. We're talking about nearly 50 kids calling at the same time. Then my husband actually gave that suggestion to go with Twitter. So on court, I could go and check the status of the court. If it was raining, I tweeted saying, "No tennis today. Courts are wet. Cancel. We will inform your makeup classes later." And that tweet, anybody can check. And we informed all the parents beforehand that if it rains. Please go to Twitter to check. We will not be calling you. We will not be emailing you. That seemed to be the best way to deal with these kind of scenarios. So I, obviously, I got a lot of help um, from my husband then as well in terms of uh, you know helping with these kind of things. Um, I don't know if we have uh, I don't know if we have the video that uh, that I wanted to show. Do we have the video downloaded? There was one video I wanted to show you. I don't have it in the. No. This is Sachin. Yes. I um I 
recently launched my book, The Moon Bowler. Uh, I launched it uh, a week ago in Chennai. Vijay Amritraj launched my book for me. And now, uh, actually this evening at 4.30 p.m., I had uh, one of the former mayors of Nagpur who launched the book for me here in Nagpur. Uh, in this, I talk about all my strategies in, in my uh, starting this business as well as all my other experiences as a tennis player as well. And the books are available outside if you'd like to uh, get a copy of it. But let me try to see if I can show you a video. But otherwise, we're almost done with uh, my talk. Let me just double check. Do we have that video? Yeah, actually we didn't. Uh, it did come out very well. Oh, it did? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, huh? I'll try to get you to... Uh, are we connected? That's okay. I mean, if we can't find it, it's not a problem. But um, this, these are a little bit of my experiences with starting, you know, uh, a business in the U.S. I was also mentioning that starting a business in the U.S. is obviously a little bit more easier because you either get it or you don't. There's no via media in between. So that also makes things a lot easier. But uh, if you all have any questions, yeah, um, I, I, I do have plans. In fact, um, I had a meeting with the All India Tourism Association president a couple of years ago to, to start something on a really national level basis, but uh, it didn't materialize. But I'm working with the Nagpur District uh, Hardcore Tennis Association, and we are going to do something in the future. It's not immediate, but it will happen. Then maybe test the waters and come back and start on your own. So, how? Uh, what was your, uh, your thought process at that moment, where you had an option to join an existing academy, maybe take credentials and training and some experience, then start up? 
Um, I was lucky in, in, in a couple of ways. One was, I had my brother who knew the ins and outs of running an academy because he worked in an academy there. But as far as the coaching philosophy is concerned, it's very hard to work under somebody, especially in that area. I didn't, there were no people who had played the level of tennis I had played. So for me to work for somebody would have been very hard because their way of thinking and their philosophies were different. So for me, I knew I had the expertise, which was, you know, reiterated when I passed the uh, USPTR credential course with like flying colors. That was reiterated. So I knew I had the, the credentials to do this. But the actual working of it, I had my brother with me. So there was no reason for me to join somewhere else to learn because he was teaching me in case I didn't know how to, you know, uh, schedule a class. He was there to help me. So he had nearly, he came, he came to our academy with nearly seven years of experience. So it was very simple for me. I knew that our philosophies were going to be totally different from the rest. So like you just said, uh, you know, playing tennis and coaching are very different in that sense. So how different is being able to coach and being able to run an enterprise in coaching? Uh, what are basic you know, differentiation? Because there must be you know pros who are very good coaches, but they're not as good as entrepreneurs as you are. Um, I think that's a really good question, and I have to say it is challenging. It's not the easiest of things because as a coach, you are committed to helping a child get better, but there are a lot of times that, for for example, a parent will say, "I don't want my child to play." So yes, as a, as a coach, I'm like really involved and I want him to come back and play tennis. <coughs> but at the same time, as a, as a business person, I have to respect what the parent says. The parent is the do all and end all of things. We know that. And so as a, as a as an entrepreneur, I have to kind of have a balance between being a coach and being an entrepreneur because there are a lot of business decisions that don't really go well as far as being a coach is concerned. So we have to have a balance in between and try and make the right choices for the child. So when you are too involved with uh, coaching and tennis, when you are running an enterprise, the love for tennis, love for the game comes in between. So I'm talking about that kind of thin, uh, thin line between the passion and the profession. You know, take it as so. Because at times you might be so passionate about the game that you forget that you are running an enterprise. And you focus on the passion. It's um. Certain qualities I think you're kind of born with. I can I I have totally understood and I'm okay with the with the fact in the beginning actually I was exactly like how you mentioned. I was really being carried away and all of a sudden if, if a child stopped playing, it would break my heart. It would really break my heart. But then end of the day, I met I met the same child two, three years later and he's fine and he's really successful at what he's doing. So we have to respect their choices. So I learned very difficult, but I learned that you know getting too involved was not the right way to run a business too. You know, you can only help them through a certain extent, but they have to want it. The parent has to want it. The child has to want it. There's so many factors in that equation that I can't control. I can be the coach and get them to the best level, but they all have to. They have to all have to be in sync with me. So that's what I learned. Yeah, I have one question. Um, so tennis has become a very competitive game. So it is not only what you work on the court, it is outside court is also important. And uh, you have to be a very good athlete in order to get to a very uh, high level of tennis. So, so in what way you work with the kids to become a good athlete to play better? Okay. So um, nowadays, you know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of exercises, a lot of routines, a lot of conditioning that you can do, which are sport specific. They're not just, uh, you know, running 400 meter sprints just because you're a tennis player. That's not the way it works anymore. There are specialized things that you can do for every sport. And people, even trainers, physical trainers who, who do these things, they get accredited just for that particular sport in the US. I don't know how it is here in India, but in the US, they have specific sports that they specialize in. And they, basically, we hire pros, we hire people 